all right so today is uh class number 20 for us so the daily quiz for today is daily quiz number 20 please uh, answer that on grade scope by tonight today is tuesday april 13th uh in terms of uh homework and studio homework 11 is due friday april 16th homework 12 will be posted later in the week uh, today it will be due the friday of the following week studio 7 the the scrolling display uh is due april 21st so i hope you guys have taken a start on it um, and if somebody has finished it you have enjoyed studio 7 studio 8 which is based on logic works is going to be due the last wednesday of our uh, semester which is april 28th Today we are going to be talking about the concept of finite state machines. Now, a couple of things I want to talk about before we get started is that a lot of students find the FSM, the finite state machines, to be uh, the, 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 the lecture in which they make that jump between all the theory that they have learned in COCO to an, a practical application. So you know i this is where all the connection uh, you know this is where you know all the hard work about why do we learn marks and decoder and uh, latches flip flop all of that comes uh, together in fsms finite state machines so let's talk about why finite why state and why machine what do those each each of those three words mean Let's bring some context to that. So let, let me just say finite. What does finite mean in FSM? Well, finite simply means that I have finite number of states, finite number of states, and just to give you guys uh, something to kind of compare this with, I'm going to bring our counter design example that we did in the last class and show you guys that we have we had six different states in our counter design right we had state 0 1 2 3 4 and 5 total of six states we had finite number of states in this state transition diagram so the fact that there is a finite over here that simply means that we are going to deal with something that has finite number of circles, finite number of states. The circles in the state diagram represent states. Now, the next term is state. What does that mean? Well, state is simply going to be, what? If I go back, what is state zero? Well, state zero is six. In six, the outputs of the flip-flops are one, one, and zero, and so on, right? So the state is tied to the current outputs of all the flip-flops in your design so perhaps i can <coughs> write this over so for state i can say this is current outputs of all flip-flops and then why machine well our counter is what is it doing well it is going from one state to the other one state to the other one state to the other as it sees active edges on the clock so the fact that it is going from one state to the other depending on certain inputs or depending on the sequence of past inputs that's what qualifies it as a machine so that's our sort of last uh, word here let's do it in machine go from one state to the other depending on inputs it could depend on inputs or it could depend on sequence of past inputs Because sequence of past inputs essentially control our current state. So that's why 
machine so finite state machine finite number of states we are monitoring the current outputs of the flip of all the flip-flops and it is essentially going to be moving from one uh, state to the other when does it do that well depending on the um, depending on the clock edge active clock edge or it could go from one state to the other when an input changes we'll talk about all the variations uh, and the two categories of fsms so in short we will essentially be calling a finite state machine simply an fsm all right so th there are going to be two lectures here one is going to deal with the concept of fsm and the second one is going to deal with the design of FSM. They are geared towards practical applications. So how can you use your flip-flops and muxes and decoders, all the combinational logic, all the sequential logic, how can you put it all together to design, for example, an elevator controller, to design a vending machine, to design a traffic light controller, something that is practical, right? So that's what we are dealing with. Uh, in this uh, set of two lectures. Now, let's go back to our general block diagram of clocked synchronous sequential circuits. Why clocked? Because these storage elements have that input of clock. They are going from one state to the other when there is an active edge on the clock. So let me just draw that. Right, these are all clocked. They are synchronous because whatever you have in your storage elements as flip-flops, right? You may have variety of flip-flops over here, D, T, J, K, whatever you want to have it or your own, uh, you know, made up flip-flop. But all those, those things, because they have feedback in them, they are storage elements. They are all going to transition from one state to the other based on the same clock input, the same timing source, which is why they are all synchronous with respect to that clock source. And they're sequential because there is dependence on sequence of past inputs and their circuits. Now these are also called state machines. And we talked about what those that means, state and machines. We are going to be using edge triggered flip-flops to design our storage elements. But if you think about a general conversation you will also have combinational network play a role in state machines. So now let's talk a little bit about this block diagram because this, this can, can be very interesting. Now you have certain inputs over here, all the way to the left, you have inputs, right? So these are binary inputs. They could be multiple bit uh, each, right? So they, 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 a variety of inputs over here. And at the far right, you have outputs of this state machine, FSM. And then you have two other outputs and we are calling them next state or the current state. Current state is what? Current state is simply the current value, current output of the flip-flops. That's determining your current state, just as it did in the case of counters. If the flip-flops outputted 110, we said that's the counter having a value of six. That was a state. So that's your current state and based on the current state and if there is an active edge you may go to the next state right and that could be a direct connection here or it could go through a combinational network so that's your input outputs next state and current state when you're talking about next state and current state it is tied to the storage elements when you're talking about inputs, these are user inputs, right? So this, this is a user, maybe toggling switches, uh, flipping switches, or pressing buttons. These are, those are the inputs. And then the outputs could be, you know, LEDs, or it could be uh, motors, right? Activate a motor. Uh, inputs could be a sensor too, right? Sensors could be over here. So based on what you see on the sensor, that is functioning as an input and then you activate a motor, for example, to move the elevator up and down. Okay. So those are your inputs. Those are your outputs. 
Now there is a combinational network in the middle. There is a sequential storage element in the middle. Now the important question to ask is this. This is it. Outputs. When do the outputs change? What do you guys think? When can the outputs change in this? So let me write that question over here. When can the outputs change? That's a very important question. And if you are able to answer this, a lot of things regarding FSMs will be very simple to understand. When do those outputs change? Andrew says, and Colin says, both of them are talking about clock pulse edges. So one, one answer to this is active edge of the clock, right? It could be a positive edge, it could be a negative edge. I don't know that yet. Depends on my design, but it is the active edge. So one answer is active edge of the clock. Active edge of clock. Okay, so that's a very valid answer. Now for that, let me highlight the path, right? Now what is the path for that signal flow? So for this, I'll track it back, right? So outputs are over here. Outputs are changing when there is an active edge on the clock. So that means the, the signal flow is from here to here to here all the way back here. You see that? So when there is an active edge on the clock, the current state will become the next state. And that next state is being fed back into a combinational network, which changes the output. Right. So, ba so this part of your answer is valid, but it is essentially highlighting this path of control flow. You guys see that? So that's one possibility. Where is the other? There is one more. When can the outputs change? One valid answer we already got. When the inputs change. Absolutely. You guys see that? So now let, let me uh, uh, highlight this. Maybe in yellow. When the input changes, any one of the input changes, the arrow is straight through, right? Because it's going through a combinational network, the changes in input will change the output. So the inputs have the ability to change the output irrespective of when the clock edge happens. That's it. That's right, Andrew. So this could be asynchronous. That's right. So active edge of the clock is one. And the other is change in input, right? So that's my second uh, 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 sort of aspect that can contribute to the output changing, change in inputs. Let me let me highlight that in yellow because that's what I, I highlighted over there. You can see that? So the outputs can change when there is a change in input, in which case I'm not waiting for the next active edge Right. Inputs change, output changes immediately. I don't wait for the clock edge. But the current state could change to the next state. For that, I'm waiting for the clock edge. So in one, I'm waiting for the clock edge. And in the other, I don't wait for the clock edge. Now, using these two aspects, we are going to classify FSMs into two categories. One is a Moore FSM and the other is the Mealy FSM. So let me let me write those statements down. A Moore FSM. Moore finite state machine is a finite state machine in which outputs can change. When Q, our current state changes. Right, that's that's our current state. Current state goes to the next state, and because of that, the outputs of the machine changed. Right. So, uh, no, it's not the same more. No, it's not the same more. Now, see. So for that, 
the path is what the outputs are changing because of this path highlighted in blue so again we can color code this all of this is blue right brilliant how should I call this Moore FSM? Should I classify that as synchronous or asynchronous? Synchronous, absolutely right, because these are only dependent on the current state and the current state goes to the next state based on the clock. It's synchronous. So Moore FSM is a synchronous FSM. Brilliant. Now, should I consider outputs changing based on inputs as the second type of F F FSM? Here is the question. Should I say the next type of FSM is outputs can change when inputs changes? Would that, would that make sense? No. We, why would we call it a FSM in that? Is. We, could, we could just call it combinational circuit in that case. Outputs change. Output change because of an input change. We call that a combinational circuit. Right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, oh yeah, outputs can change when input changes as a different type of FSM. But instead, I would include the current state in that statement. Right. So I would say my second type of FSM is a melee FSM in which outputs can change when input changes, when inputs change or Q changes the current state goes to the next state, right? So, either of them, the, the only difference is Q changes based on the clock, inputs change based on the user. So that can happen any, at any time, which is why we are going to call Mili FSM a asynchronous FSM. Let me highlight that in yellow. Technically speaking, because I'm color coding this, I should be highlighting this in yellow as well as blue, right? Because there, there are both of these things playing a role in, in, in melee. And that is a synchronous machine. So let me also write that. Synchronous. Uh, sorry, asynchronous. I want you guys to kind of absorb this classification based, we, we only asked one question, when do the outputs change? And based on that question, we classify two reasons why they could change. One is change in inputs. The other is based on the active edge of the clock. Using those two, we formulated that classification of more finite state machine and mealy finite state machine. I'll give you, this is sort of a very uh, fundamental idea for that classification uh, because there is a very subtle difference when it comes to Mealy FSM, right? When can the output change? They don't necessarily wait for the clock edge. They can change immediately when the input changes. All right, doesn't look like you guys have. Uh, so because of the R in the melee definition, it could be synchronous, uh, asynchronous. You meant asynchronous. Right, you meant asynchronous. That's, that, that's right, because of this R. This changes or this changes, the outputs can change. Q changes synchronously with clock, but the outputs are users, right? They can change it at, at any time. 
they don't have to wait for the clock edge. And you're right. That's exactly why. Okay. Now let's talk about, uh, you know, the examples of finite state machines. Where could this play a role? We are going to spend uh, time talking about um, more examples, but this is just a sample. A vending machine could be a finite state machine in which inputs are points to the vending machine, buttons that the user presses. The outputs is vending of some food, return of coins as change. Right, so you have a vending machine in which there are some inputs, there are some outputs. So we are, we are essentially talking about what goes here and what goes here, right? And based on the, based on whoever designs the finite state machine, all of this will be figured out, right? What, what goes here, what goes here, that is figured out by the person designing that vending machine, finite state machine. But right now we are just focusing on that input and the outputs here. So inputs and outputs for vending machine could be points and buttons as far as inputs are concerned. For output, it could vend some uh, food items or it could give the user some change. Are counters finite state machine? Excellent question. They are absolutely finite state machine. I need you guys to tell me which type. Which type? We talked about two types, right? Which type? of finite state machine was the counter that we designed. It was more, yes. It was more, right? No, 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 the, 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 the one that we designed. The one that we designed went from one state to the other based on the clock edge. There was no input to this. Yeah, 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 there was no input to this. No user input, absolutely. There was no user input at all. All the outputs, right, the outputs were essentially our current state. So all we had was, you see, outputs of the counter was our current state. So there was no combinational, this, this connection was direct. You see that? So, but there is clear. asynchronous so here the 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 asynchronous and the synchronous aspect of melee and more finite state machines has to do with the outputs changing right so i thought you were talking about oh you know not the 74163 the, the i was talking about this guy the 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 counter that we designed uh, uh from scratch you guys came up with the accounting sequence and then we used three different types of flip-flops to do this. 163 is a melee, uh, 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 so I would have to look at the internal diagram of the 163 chip to tell you whether it is melee or not. You can clear anything asynchronously, right? So that that is not a criteria to call it asynchronous FSM versus synchronous. FSM. You can classify that as uh, clearing it because it's a special input. It, it clearing the, it has an asynchronous clear versus a synchronous clear. But output is equal to zero from an input. Uh, so that is like a, that's not a, um, that's a special application for the clear right so it's it's not a, a, a general behavior overall it is a special reaction to one uh, input for clear so i would call that synchronous clear versus asynchronous clear i wouldn't use that same aspect to call it synchronous fsm versus asynchronous fsm what i would do for synchronous and asynchronous is look at how are the, when are the in outputs changing, right? The outputs for general, in the general case, are they changing as soon as inputs are changing or do they wait for the current state to
to take over uh, the, uh, to go to the next state all right so let's uh, go back here all right so for vending machine our inputs and outputs were points buttons you're confused but the requirement is output can change when the inputs change yeah but that's a special case right so when you are clearing things that's a special special input It's not a it's not a generic input. That's not the usual behavior of your FSM. You clear only for uh, you know limited number of times. I'm saying that the classification of FSM has to do with its general uh, general behavior. All right, so what we're doing, okay, okay, so vending machine, right, input, input, we can talk about that. Elevator, what could be our inputs and outputs? Inputs could be buttons and sensors. Uh, right, Tom, you're right. So that's a special case input, right? Like that's not something that you would use uh, all the time. Inputs for an elevator, these could be coming uh, from the buttons inside the elevator, outside the elevator, or there could be sensors monitoring the motion of the elevator, or which floor is it at. The outputs could be turning certain lights on and off to maybe indicate to the user which floor you are on, and certain motors that control the movement of the elevator up and down or stationary. A computer is also a finite state machine. In fact, the, the control unit, the control unit, which is part of the computer, is the biggest finite state machine you can think of. Because it is going from many, state, many states to many other states. Inputs to this could be through a keyboard, to a network, to a memory, to, to a hard disk. The outputs of a computer could be display or a network net network uh, such as a local area network functions as both input and output and the microcontroller which is essentially invisible to the user uh, says what connects to what at each cycle so when we start talking about you know a, a control unit and how it plays a role in a computer organization we will try to see some aspects of a, a computer as a finite state machine for example, I am doing some ALU operation right now. Uh, my result of the ALU operation was negative and so on and on and on. Uh, I'm getting hype for Kinos, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you, you will see control unit uh, in, in Kinos uh, a lot. And we, we will see some, some of it uh, even in Kinos uh, in the last couple of lectures. All right. Now let's do our first finite state machine. And it's a very, very simple one, yet it can be very confusing. The finite state machine that we are trying to design right now, not completely, right? So right now our goal is to sketch the state diagram, right? So that's, that's it. Let us try to come up with the state diagram. Later on, we will see that from the state diagram, we can very easily go to the symbolic state transition table. We can then go to an encoded state transition table, and then we can actually build the finite state machine. But what the step that tends to be the most uh, critical, and you need to sort of pay attention and be a little bit creative at times is right here, sketching the state diagram. Peter says, my fox senses are tingling. All right, hopefully, you know, we can, we can, we can um, put those senses to rest. We can ease that a little bit now. So the goal of this finite state machine that we are trying to design is to do an odd parity check, right? So I want you guys to assume that there is one wire on which 
there is a continuous bit stream coming in, right? A sequence of bits are coming in on one wire. And I want this particular uh, finite state machine. Let, let, let me let me draw it over here. After shoot. No, not black. Right. So I want this finite state machine to do this. So suppose I have a new box, please. All right. This is just one bit, right? So this there is an input here and it's a bit sequence or bit stream. One after the other, things are coming in. And I want this uh, FSM, the odd parity tech FSM to give me an output that is a one when there when odd number of ones are detected when odd number of ones are detected and it should give me a zero when even number of ones are detected on the input And both of them are on the input, right? So essentially you have a sequence of bits coming in over here, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, continuous, right? Continuous bit stream coming in over here. And the FSM is supposed to monitor the bits as they are coming in and give you one output bit, which is either a 0 or a 1. It is going to be a 1 if until that time they are odd number of 1s right, in that continuous bit stream, or it is going to change to a zero when there are even number of ones as they come in, right? Let me talk a little bit more about the behavior of, well, like what I want to do, like the behavior of this. The so odd parity check example. So this is essentially what I want my FSM to do. I'm going to consider some arbitrary input, right? Some input. This is going to be my sequence of bits that are coming in to the FSM, functioning as one bit input. So let me just say 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, right? Some, some, some arbitrary zeros and ones are coming in, right? And let us say uh, these guys are coming in at uh, the gray line. Great line. I'm just going to sort of uh, mark the time at which they are coming in, right? So I'll say this is coming at a T0, T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on, right? So one bit input coming into my machine and x-axis is sort of time, right? So initially it was a zero, after some time there was a one, after some time it changed to one and so on. Now, I need to determine the output for this odd parity check. This is just an example to demonstrate what is the kind of behavior we want our FSM to do, right? That That's the sort of the... What are we asking it to do? Output. It's an odd parity checker. What does that mean? The number of ones in my uh, bit sequence so far, if they are odd, I'm going to send a one at the output, right? So where should the output start? Your X nor previous and next as output. Previous and next, <laughs> yes. So, what should what what should my output be? After I see a zero, what should I my output be? Zero, right? But it is not going to be immediately at at t zero. 
it is going to be slightly later right so it's going to be slightly after t0 because there is going to be some propagation delay through the fsm what about uh, the output soon after t1 it should be a one because so far you have seen odd number of ones right so far you have seen odd number of ones so your output is going to detect that as a odd parity and it is sending you a one at the output all right what happens after t2 what is the output going to be after t2 it is going to be a zero because uh, zero followed by a one followed by another one made it even parity you could also use a t lash to toggle after every one input yes andrew yes that's where we are going hold on <laughs> you are giving away all the answers at the beginning wait a minute let's go through it all right so zero one came in one came in and our output kept changing right so the output was starting with a zero it changed to a one then it went to a zero and then i'm just going to sort of uh tell you guys the the result here and you can check my work so after the third uh bit input bit i had even parity still even became odd still odd became even became odd you guys see that so uh, this is some example right so it's particular it's important to note that this is an example to demonstrate what is the desired behavior of my fsm right it's it's it, of course when you build it and you uh, you know use it that is not going to be the same sequence that is going to come in this is just an example of what could be the input and for that particular input sequence what should be the output all right questions about uh, the 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 output uh, what are we doing make output a one make output equal one when there are odd number of ones on the input both input and output are one bit right one bit so what could be confusing here is when you see so many bits you may think that oh it is actually eight or nine bits input no it's not it's just one input that is changing with time and as it changes with time we are also trying to detect the uh, the number of ones that has had that, that have appeared so far all right uh questions about what our odd parity checker should do yes it would be exclusive or that's right or you can also do it with the toggle all right so let's go back here our odd parity checker the objective of this finite state machine is to assert the output meaning make the output one active whenever the input bit stream has odd number of ones so take a look at the input bit stream the sequence continuous sequence of bits that are coming in take a look at that count the number of ones and if that number happens to be odd make the output one that's our objective now for that we have drawn this particular state diagram it has two states because it has two circles the states are even state and odd state right that the your your finite state machine could either 
be detecting even number of ones or could be detecting odd number of ones at any given time your output could be a zero could be a one right so we can you can classify that as two states in my odd parity checker i could be in the even state or it i could be in the odd state so based on that i've drawn two circles even and odd and within even and odd i have written a zero and a one what is that the zero over here indicates the output so let me draw this over so if you have you if you are in the odd state then make the output one if you are in the even state that means you have you have even number of ones right now on the input your output is a zero those are your inputs uh, those are your outputs it, there is just one out one output so output these guys are your inputs one two and even the reset all of those are your input So look at this. First, we have a reset input. So to sort of initialize our finite state machine. That's your reset input. As soon as you start the finite state machine, you would want to start at some state, right? And we are resetting our finite state machine to the even state. In other words, my output initially is a zero. Then, when I am in the even state, there are two possibilities. I could either get a zero on the input or I could get a one on the in, uh, input. If I get a zero on the input, then I am going to be in that same even state. This is called a self loop. Self loop. I'm in the even state, I got a zero on the input, which means that I did not change parity. I'm going to stay in that same state and my output is going to be zero. But if I'm in the even state and I get a one on the input, I will jump to the odd state where my output becomes a one. You guys see that? Next. Let's talk about what would happen when you are in the odd state. Now, suppose you are in the odd state. In the odd state, output is a 1 because you have checked that the number of 1s in the input bitstream are odd right now. Two things can happen even here. If you are in the odd state, the next input that comes in could be a 0 or could be a 1. If it's a 0, you get another self loop. That means that there is no change in parity. Because the number of ones hasn't changed. Or you could get a one. If you get a one, then in fact you go back to the even state where your output becomes a zero. So you have circles indicating the states in the state diagram. And then you have arrows or arcs indicating transitions. Now it is important to note where do, where do the inputs lie and where are we writing the outputs? Where are we writing the inputs? Where are we writing input? Uh, outside the circle, I would say on, on the arcs or the arrows, right? on the arrows or arcs. That's where, so essentially, no matter which state you are in, two arrows are coming out, depending on the two choices you have for the input. If you had four choices for the input, then you would have four arrows coming out of each state. But 
the input itself is written on the arrow or the arc. What about the output? Where are the outputs written? Where are we writing output? Inside the circles. Brilliant. We are writing the output inside the circle. What is the circle? What does the circle represent? States. Okay. So, let's try to put this in perspective here. Outputs are inside the circle. Circle represents the current state. With me so far? Outputs are inside the circle and circle represents the states. Which type of FSM did we just uh, draw? More. Perfect. That's exactly right. You see, in the more finite state machine, the outputs will be part of the state. They will be directly dependent on the current state or the present state. Now let me ask you a different question. If this was a mealy machine, where would you write the outputs? The output would be the combination of the states and the inputs. That's right. So where would you write it? Would you write it here or would you write it? Would you would you make it a part of the circle? You cannot make it a part of the circle, right? Because inside the circle, that's the present state. So outputs for a mealy machine would not be written over here. So the next question is, where should I write them? I would write them over here. You know, no, no, no. I would write them on the arcs as the same as inputs. So I would write input slash outputs. So it would be belonging to the arc itself. You see that? We will see more examples. So I hope that you guys were able to classify this as a Moore FSM. Because the output depends on the state. That's it, right? The output depends on the state. So it should be Moore. So the arcs don't have to indicate a change in state. No, no, the arcs are re representing the change in state. But the change is happening because of input in Moore. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the change is happening due to that particular input, but the change is happening at the active edge of the clock. Right, so the, the, the output is over here. This is change of the state due to that being the input. But the outputs are associated with the state. So the arcs do not have to indicate a change in state. They are they always, arcs always indicate the change in state. Alright, so let's try to take a look at how do you transition the state diagram to a symbolic state transition table. This is going to be easy. Once you come up with the state diagram, Everything else is going to be very systematic. It's going to follow one step after the other and things are going to be very systematic, structured, very less probability that you will go wrong there. Right? So let's take a look. There is always going to be 
certain columns in the state transition table. First column is going to be present state, input, next state, output. That's it. That, that's going to be the structure of the state transition table. Your present state will become next state depending on the input and your output is going to depend on the present state. That's it, right? Outputs are over here. If you are currently in the even state, output is zero. If you are in the out state, output is a one. Even, even, z, uh, uh, even, even, odd, odd, zero, zero, one, one. Output equals present state. Next. If you are in the even state, right now you are here, right? And you get an input of zero, where do you go? If you are in the even state and you get an input of zero, you go back to state even. And because your present state is even, output is a zero. Next, between present state and input, there are four possibilities, right? 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 and 1, 1. Be and because we are still symbolic right now, I have not encoded even as 0 and odd as 1 just yet. So I'm doing even 0, even 1, odd 0, odd 1. If you are in the even state and you get a 1, you go to the odd state, right? So let's try to highlight this. What is this? indicating let's do it in maybe pink let's do this one what is that particular entry in the symbolic state transition table where is that in our state diagram it is right here you see that if you are in the even state and you get a one on the input you will transition to the odd state when do you transition to the odd state well, that depends on the active edge of the clock, right? So after you get the next active edge of the clock, then you will transition to the next state. But you will transition because of that input. Next, if you are in the odd state and you get a zero, you will stay in the odd state. So maybe I can also highlight this. This is this guy right here. So if you are in the art state, you get a zero on the input, you will stay there. And because you are in the art state, your output is a one. And the last entry is, if you are right now in the art state and you get another one, right? Now it has made it even parity. So next state is even and your output is a one. Why? Because you are right now in the art state. Now th there is one confusion that, uh, so, you know, is very common. The outputs are not dependent on the next state. They are dependent on the previous state, right? So the outputs, we are not talking about what would be the output next. We are talking about what is it right now, right? So outputs are dependent on the present state. If you are in even, output is zero. If you are in odd, your output is one. All right, so questions about how do you go from state diagram to a symbolic state transition table? Questions here? Okay, now from the state diagram to the symbolic state transition table, I hope it was, um, you know, pretty straightforward because all you did was have this structure, present state, input, next state, output. Present states could be even, could be odd. Next state could be even, could be odd. 
you have a one bit input and you have a one bit output because you have present state as two possibilities and input as two possibilities you have four options over here and based on those four options and the state diagram you will compute the next state in the output outputs are going to be present state next this is a symbolic state transition table because of the words being used as even and odd zeros and ones i like right they are already encoded in bits but even and odd are not encoded in bits yet so that is going to be our next step which is to go from the symbolic state transition table to an encoded state transition table so symbolic is over here and encoded is at the bottom the only difference is you have, we have said even is zero odd is one is this the only encoding that is possible no you can you could have as well reversed it you could have made output as zero and uh, uh, odd as zero even as one that's that would have been fine this is one such encoding that we have done so we have gone from symbolic to state transition table essentially we have said let us try to take even and map it to a zero and take it take odd and map it to a one everywhere in our table for both the next state as well as the present state columns we still have the same state diagram that is shown here so sometimes the encoding is not very obvious right when you have more states then the encoding is not um, clear you have to be a little bit creative and we'll see examples about that and different encodings are going to have different costs, meaning different uh, number of gates, different number of literals and all that, different number of transistors. But that, that's, that's not what we are trying to sort of maximize, minimize here. The, we are not trying to look at minimizing the cost. We are simply trying to implement this R parity check FSM. So once you have the encoded state transition table uh, and i can maybe write this right like all we did here was we said even encoded as zero odd encoded as one right that's it once you do that your next step is to write logic expressions for the two columns one is next state and the other is output So let's use um, input we will call that say maybe w uh, for present state we will call it ps for next state we will call it ns for output let us use the letter z so can you guys tell me what is the logic expression for z what is the logic expression for z z equals present state why because this column exactly matches that column output equals present state okay next uh what is our next one next state next state equals what what is the logic expression for next state That's right. Present state exclusive or W. This is this is what Andrew has been saying all along, right? So he's been saying exclusive or exclusive or that's where what we see over here. So next state is present state exclusive or our input and output is present state. Z is present state. Questions about how we wrote the uh, logic expressions. Let's zoom out. State diagram first. Then we went to the symbolic state transition table. Then we went to the st encoded state, trans uh, state transition table. 
And now we have written logic expressions for the output as well as the next state. In terms of input and present state. And again, you can see output depends on present state. Moore machine. Now, this is going to be our D flip-flop implementation first. What did we do? Here is our input, W. Here is our output, Z. Or PS, they are both the same, Z equals PS, right? So present state is the output of the flip-flop. And for this odd parity checker, we are right now using a D flip-flop. Because for D flip-flop, what is the characteristic equation of a D flip-flop? Can anybody help me out? Characteristic equation of D flip-flop. Characteristic equation of a D flip-flop. Okay, fine. So Q plus equals D, right? Q plus equals D, that's right. The next state is whatever you provided the input. And what do I want as the input? Uh, uh, next state equals D, right? That's the characteristic equation. It looks like I want the next state to be the exclusive OR operation between the present state and the input, right? So what I did simply here is took the present state from the output of the flip-flop went into the exclusive OR with input to generate, what is this? What is over here? Here we have PS exclusive OR W and I have connected that to the input of D such that my next state will be whatever is connected at the input here. PS exclusive OR W. You guys see that? So I can use the D flip-flop which essentially helps me not putting one more column into my state transition table. I have chosen this finite state machine to be a positive edge trigger design. There is a active low reset that is available to me in order for it to initialize the present state or the output to initialize to a zero. So essentially what I was able to do here is I was able to take the two expressions that I had from before, right, which was output equals prop, uh, present state, right? We said Z equals PS from earlier. What is present state? The output of the flip-flop. What is Z? The output of the FSM. They are both the same. So it's the, it's the same output here. Both of them are the same. And using this exclusive R, I was able to connect it in such a way that this particular expression also gets implemented. So that's a, here is your one bit input coming in, here is your one bit output that is going to check the odd parity. Questions about how we did the, how we did the D flip-flop implementation. Whatever you give at the out input of the D flip-flop, that's what becomes the next state, right? So I'm giving at the D present state exclusive or W so that my next state becomes present state exclusive or W input. That's, that's what I have here. All right. Now, I also want to talk about how we would implement this same finite state machine using a toggle flip-flop. So let's take a look. Uh, we did this. Let me add a page here and talk about how we would do it. If the criteria was use a toggle flip-flop to do it. We would take the same state table but encode it. Encode it. State transition table.
we would take the same thing so let's say we have root and then that what what all we did we have here i think we had present state uh, input was w next state uh, and then we are going to figure out the t input t over here as well let's see present state input 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 this is encoded right so i've already done the encoding as uh, even is 0 odd is 1 for that I have, the next column is input could be a 0 could be a 1 what is my next state going to be well if you are presently in the 0 and you get another 0 your next state is also a 0 self loop 0 you get a 1 you become odd 1 you become a 0 you are odd 1 you become a 1 you become even right? so I have essentially written the, the same thing again right same thing 0 1 1 0 now here is the thing t what should i provide at the t input such that the this present state goes to that next state so the the two columns that i'm monitoring right now are here and here i want that present state to go to this next state zero should not toggle to zero don't toggle please toggle don't toggle please toggle see that zero to zero don't toggle zero to one toggle one to one don't toggle one to zero toggle how about the outputs will z change z will z change here no, Z is going to be present state. So 0, 0, 1, 1. So let's try to write an equation for T. What should you write for T? What is the logic expression for T? W, perfect. This column matches that column. T equals W. T input equals W. Positive edge trigger design, active low reset, output equals present state. Right, so this is this is sort of equals present state. Doesn't matter. That's our output. And then the complemented version is also available. You guys see that? So for the same finite state machine, we were able to implement it using a D flip-flop. We were also able to implement it using the T flip-flop. Next, let's take a look at some timing behavior issues that we could have. Just as we, you could also drop PS exclusive or NS. Uh, hmm, where? My next state is the, the next output, right? So it has not come in yet. So how am I going? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out what should I give to the input of the toggle flip-flop so that the present state becomes next state, right? So I'm trying to use the, right? I'm trying to use excitation table of the T, right? All right, now let us take a look at some timing diagram issues that FSMs have to deal with. Just as we did at the very beginning of the odd parity checker, which was we considered some arbitrary input and then we tried to uh, figure out the behavior, the desired behavior of the FSM by finding the uh, uh, corresponding output. Similarly, now we will do the same thing with another input but we will also have the clock associated with our design. So our input starts off with a one, then becomes a zero, then zero, one, one, and so on, right? 
and we have a clock that is essentially uh, you know a, a coming say from a crystal oscillator right so some some timing source some crystal oscillator and our input is say user right so maybe the user is pressing buttons or flipping switches on and off and that is your input clock is a timing source such as a crystal oscillator is it going to be is it going to be um well let, let, let i'll ask you guys that question later uh you have a clock and we have we have decided that this design is a positive edge trigger design so our output if you were trying to sketch the output timing waveform we would essentially be considering only the positive edges of the uh, clock isn't that right so let me just take a say a blue color here a positive edge another positive edge another positive edge and so on right so those are the positive edges of the clock at the first positive edge you look at the first one when you look at the first one that is odd number of ones so your output becomes a one and it stays that stays there until the next positive edge happens at the next positive edge you have an input of zero which means no change in parity still odd parity at the next positive edge you have another zero no change in parity still output is one and at the next positive edge it is going to take a look at a one make the output zero because now you have gone back to even parity and so on now the question here is this what would happen if i changed the input like this say after the first after the first positive edge i change the input and made it a zero like i have changed the input many times between the first positive edge and the second positive edge does my output change no it doesn't i have changed the parity so many times right i have changed it even odd even odd so i could have left it at even parity i could have left left it at odd parity who knows but my output did not change because the only thing that mattered here was what was the input at the time of the positive edge of the clock you guys see that so it didn't matter what happened in the middle what mattered was what was the input when the positive edge of the clock was happening you guys see that now i think now you are ready for the next question so why did we not consider this that seems like a large problem that's a huge problem so the, the that's why i'm asking you guys the question why why did we not consider this as a issue why didn't we make a big issue out of this any ideas the hint is right here we can use the input as the clock ah uh, no 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 positive edges will toggle no the, the the reason why we didn't make it a big issue is because users are very slow clock is fast it would it would not be reasonable for one oh bouncing sure but you do it deal with bouncing in a different way right we, you you don't deal with bouncing in this way 
But the reason why we don't consider this as something that uh, could stop us from designing finite state machine like this, that's right, Jeremy. Users can't change the input fast enough to make this. That's absolutely right. <laughs> well, we can have you compete with a clock, say like a 450 megahertz clock, and then you have to flip switches on and off faster than that. <laughs> All right, so that's the reason why we don't make it a big deal because the user is providing that input, right? Whether be it, you know, pressing a switch, toggling a, a flipping on and off, pressing a button, um, inserting coins, you know, uh, whatever the inputs are for the examples that we saw, those tend to be much slower than the clock. The clock is going to be at a very, very high speed. So it, it is actually going to be sampling, right? It is going to actually be seeing. Right now we are saying that the input and clock have a very small difference. But as you can see, the clock could change many, many times. The reality is clock actually changes many, many times uh, within that input being held at a one or a zero. Right. So that is the reason why we didn't make that a big deal. Uh, why shouldn't we set the toggle input to one? Why shouldn't we set the toggle input to one and have that be input be connected to the clock? Uh, no, I, so here for this particular case that might work, but that would not be a design choice that I would make for a general finite state machine, right? So what if the input was connected to a computer or a microcomputer that was changing the input very, very fast, then we would need a clock to be even faster. Our clock has to be catching all the changes in the input. If you change, if you make those changes too fast, then, and if you're not able to keep track of it, then this criteria, this design criteria fails. All right, so th that's essentially sort of um, summarized over here. For machines where the user can press a button at any time, the machine samples the input faster than the users can press or stop pressing, which is why this can work. Because all that matters is, what is the input at the time of the rising edge of the clock? That's what matters. Right? That's what matters. What is the input at the time the edge is rising? And we, we, we kind of work around this problem because of the fact that the machine is sampling it faster than the users can change. All right, questions about this odd parity checker example that we did. So in real world example, these inputs are changing fairly quickly. Well, again, it depends on the finite state machine. Uh, some are going to be inputs being slow, some are going to be fast. Now, if you think about a computer, right, uh, a keyboard input, that's input coming in very, very fast but the clock that it is monitoring that input is much faster than that, right? So the clock has to be faster than the input uh, changes. How are you supposed to change fast enough? It doesn't sample more than you want. How are you supposed to? Uh, so, uh, it doesn't sample more than you want. So the clock is what is setting the sampling rate. Right. And the the speed of the clock is essentially going to limit the speed at which the inputs can change. Now, if the, 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 the user, if they are changing way fast compared to the clock, then that would not be a design, a proper design. They would have to pick the clock that is much faster than the changes in the input if they want to be able to catch it. Otherwise, they will not. It's very intuitive, right? So if you want to see something changing, then you need a sensor that can see that change. 
adjust the clock in a microcontroller makes it look like I move in slow motion. You're absolutely right. Right. So if you even talk about a press of a button, flipping of a switch, you know, they tend to be uh, for a longer duration, much longer duration of time than a, a high speed clock. All right. Let's uh, this as this, uh, uh, this right. If it's too fast, it will sample too fast. If I'm changing it from one to zero, it'll count like a million ones. All right. So it it it's uh, while you are counting it as so it it doesn't have to be that fast. Right. It has to be fast enough for the inputs to change. But depending on what kind of FSM that you're dealing with, the, the, the point here is that the clock edge is taking into consideration what is the input at that particular time. Now, let's go back to that classification. Two types of FSM and they both depend on the same question when can the output change now, can the output change uh, based on the current state well if it is only changing based on the current state when that current state goes to the next state then we call it a more machine in which things are synchronous outputs can change when the state changes on the clock edge that's what we have seen so far in, in the odd parity checker but there is another set of finite state machines called the mealy finite state machines which are asynchronous meaning the outputs can change when the input changes independent of the clock or the next clock edge which is the state changing for from current state to the next state q to q plus in that like i mentioned earlier you write the inputs and outputs on the arcs they would not be in the circles for the more your outputs will be part of the circle for mealy, your inputs will be part of the inputs and outputs will be part of the arc or the arrow. So let's talk about that uh, difference between the Moore and Mealy finite state machine in their own sort of uh, block diagram. You have your inputs over here, right? Inputs, outputs. Then there are two combinational logic. Uh, blocks that could be present. So there is a combinational logic here and there is a combinational logic here, right? No memory, just combinational logic. Then there is memory over here, state memory. So sequential elements are present over here, which are also clocked by the uh, clock signal. Typically, they are edge trigger D flip flops just because of how easy it is to work with the D flip flop. Uh, the simplicity is because of the characteristic equation, right? Q plus equals D. So whatever you want next, you just connect it to the input of the D flip flop and you will get it after the active edge of the clock. So for a more machine, you see how the in outputs are dependent. So let me track that in maybe pink. For a more machine, output depends on the current state only, right? So the current state is output of the sequential elements typically flip-flops, D flip-flops. So when the current change, current state changes <clears throat> after the clock signal, uh, active edge of the clock signal, based on some output logic, right now we didn't have, in the previous example, our output logic was zero, right? Like uh, not zero, there was nothing, right? It was just simply Z equals PS. So there was no output logic, but there could have been output logic, for example, if Z was PS complement, then our output logic would have been a NOT gate over there. We, we, we didn't have that uh, in our previous example. We just had Z equals PS. So things were, you know, get going straight through. But as you can see, for a Moore machine, the outputs are dependent only on the current state. However, for a mealy machine, let me let me draw a mealy machine. If for a for a mealy machine, you would have a dependence also on the inputs, right? So the, the the way it would work is you would have another set of arrow, uh, uh, an, another connection going from here 
all the way to here. So then your inputs are changing and your outputs will change. That would be a mealy machine. That is missing right now for more. So some combinational logic over here, muxes, decoders, logic gates, whatnot. Then some state memory, flip-flops, some output logic, again combinational, muxes, decoders, whatnot. Um, and inputs will control the excitation for the sequential elements, going from current state to next state, and then based on the uh, output logic, your outputs will change. Now, uh, in the remaining time that we have, let us talk about another Moore machine. This one is a Moore machine state diagram. Hold up. Let, uh, did I miss? Oh, the comparison is later. All right. Another Moore machine. This is for a vending machine, right? So. We are asked to design a vending machine that can take nickels and dimes, so two different types of inputs. Uh, so let's just start using some variables for this. Nickels, I will call that N, and dimes, I can call it say, D. And it sells items that cost 15 cents. There are two different types of inputs, nickels and dimes as coins, to the that can go into the vending machine and it is going to vend you food that costs only 15 cents uh it keeps the change yeah i know if you pay two dimes it is going to keep the change so if you go to 20 cents then it is going to keep the change it is still going to give you the uh, item for 15 cents we are going to ignore the clock in this example we are going to um, we are going to transition from one state to the other when the user inserts a coin you're, you're getting food for 15 cents it gives five cents isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's true all right so we are ignoring the clock right now and we are saying that the transitions are going to occur when you insert a coin now i will go back to andrew's point when he said, if it is too fast, then I'm changing a million times. Let's talk about it now. Because now you see the dependence on clock has been removed. For realistic finite state machines, that's what you do. Your, your clock is not going to be a, a major factor for slow applications. When things are slow, then you will transition from one state to the other, not based on a clock, but maybe based on inserting a coin, for example, right? So that you, you have to sort of change your uh, methodology, design methodology, depending on the kind of FSM that you are designing. I hope that makes it clear there. Next, the re one of the assumptions that uh, we are making is that the user must hit reset button to restart the machine after you vend an item for 15 cents all right so you guys are okay with the with the sort of the problem here the problem is take in nickels and dimes give an output uh, or vend an item when you reach 15 cents or more right so now let's take that and let us draw our own state diagram. The first thing that you draw in a state diagram is what? States. Nice. So states are circles, right? So I need to understand, I, I need to figure out how many states should I, um, should I draw? Let's go back to this. How many states do you think I need to draw here? There are many correct answers. I just want you, I just want to poll you guys about your ideas. Uh, two states. What are the two states?
Uh, no, no, no. So the nickels and dimes are inputs, right? And based on those inputs, you will be going from one state to the other. Payment and vending. Okay, so J Jeremy says, I only have two states in my vending machine. One is give the food and the other is don't give the food. Now, if you don't give the, f and, and if you do this, how are you going to keep track of the steps that are involved? Because it's not just one step, right? It's not just one input getting you to the uh, uh, 15 cents. Peter says four states. How about this? Perfect. Five cents, 10 cents, 15 cents, 20 cents. Uh, how about zero? Let's do a reset. Zero. So how about, how about we do this? Zero, five, 10 and 15. I don't need 20 because 20 is more like 15. You guys see that? I don't have any money in my vending machine. I have five cents. I have 10 cents, I have 15 cents, right? So those could be my four states. Can you guys think of another possibility in which you may have more, more than four states? Uh, Shini, right now it is just a finite state machine. We have not, so the ignoring the clock based on the input, it has nothing to do with the Mealy machine uh, versus Moore machine, right? So it, it, it is, we, we are asked to design a Moore machine, right? We, we are asked to design a Moore machine, but that has not happened yet. As we draw the state diagram, we will be uh, taking that into consideration. In other words, I could design the same vending machine with the same st statements, but it could be a mealy machine. I could I could do that. Right now, I'm just um, designing a Moore machine. Uh, let's see. We keep the quarter and give them nothing for breaking the rules. Invalid input. Somebody ignores the dimes and nickels inputs. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. So here, I, I will give you guys the, the sort of the two two options right one option would be one option for states one option could be zero cents one cent two cents three cents da, 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 uh, 15 cents we could have 16 different states that correspond to how much money does the vending machine currently have this is an option it's a pretty bad option because we will not be using this guy this guy this guy many of them right we are not even going to go there because we only accept nickels and dimes but that is an option our second option that is the one that we are going to use is let us have a state in which the current amount of money in the vending machine is zero cents, no money. That will help us sort of start things off. We can also use this as a reset state. And five cents, then 10 cents, and then 15 cents. So that's going to be sort of my uh, approach here. I'm going to go for a state diagram which has four states that essentially going that that is going to tell me how much money is currently there in the vending machine so i'm going to draw four circles here to begin with uh, let us say i have one circle here two three uh, two then maybe four and then i can also label them right so i can i can use the label the this i can call this as state 0 State 1, State 2, State 3. I've got four set states here. State 0 is when 
the vending machine has zero cents. State one is when the vending machine has five cents. State two, 10 cents. State three, 15 cents. Chini, right now is when we are going to make the decision of this being a Moore machine. Now we are going to make that decision. Should I vend an item? Should I vend an item when I am in state 0? In which state should I vend an item? Only in state 3. That's right. So, because it's a Moore machine that I'm trying to design, I'm going to make the output of vending slash not vending part of the state itself, part of the circle. So I'm going to say, don't vend here. Don't vend here. Don't vend here. Please vend here. You guys see that? So I've made the output part of the state. Now let's talk about all my inputs and outputs. Inputs are what? Inputs are nickels and dimes. Those are my coins. And then output, there's only one output. Uh, there's no outputs. There is just one output. What is that? Vend or don't vend. That's it. And you only vend an item 15 cents when you are in state 3. That's why it is becoming a Moore machine. Because I have made the outputs part of the states. Next, I'm going to complete this uh, state diagram here based on the statements that we have written. Right? So let's do that. First things first, I'm going to draw a reset arrow. From wherever, if I press a reset, I come back to state 0. From wherever. We connect reset to state 0. Yeah, right. From wherever I am, if I press a reset, I will come to state 0. Where? I will have no money in the vending machine. Next. I want you guys to think of at least the two options that you will have from each of the sta states each of the four states. From state 0, you could get a nickel or you could get a dime. So, tell me you guys, where should you go when you get a nickel? Where should you go when you get a dime? Nickel to S1, dime to S2. Perfect. Nickel takes you to S1. A dime takes you to S2. Perfect. Let's make that same evaluation starting from state 1. If you are in state 1, you could get a nickel, you could get a dime. Where should you go from here? For a nickel and a dime. Get a nickel, go to S2. Get a dime, go to S3. Alright, how about S2? If you are starting at S2 and you get a nickel or you get a dime, where should you go? For S2, if we get either, it goes to S3. That's right. Nickel or dime. Nickel or dime takes you to S3, in which you will open the floodgates to the 15 cent food item. 
Now, if you are in S0, is there a possibility that you will stay there? Uh, what if you don't get a nickel and you don't get a dime or you press a reset? If N and D are 0, 9, 0, you're right. So if you don't press, uh, if you don't enter a nickel or you don't enter a dime or the user were to press a reset, you will have a self loop on S0. No nickel, no dime, or reset. S1 will have the same thing. If you are in S1 and you don't get a nickel or you don't get and you don't get a dime, stay there. You can't. You can't do both. Only one one slot. Uh, did we talk about that? We are taking only one slot in. So that's an assumption that we are making. One coin slot. So you can either only like do one, one at a time. From state two, again, same possibility. No nickel, no dime. Stay there. If you are in S3, you will vend an item and you will stay there if you don't press a reset. If you don't press a reset in S3, you will just stay there. You guys see that? That is a state diagram that we have come up with based on the statements that we were given and based on the assumptions that we made. We are only vending the things when we are in state uh, 3, state in which I have 15 cents, which is what makes it a Moore machine. I could have also gone with option number 1 in which I have 16 states, but that would have costed me a, a, a lot more real estate as far as my vending machine FSM is concerned. But that, that would complete your um, state diagram. This one is shown, again, we have, we have sort of derived it just now, but this is shown in the form of a slide over here. One thing that I would like to point out over here is it makes it a Moore machine because the states are, uh, sorry, output is part of the state. Outputs are over here, 0, 0, 0, 1. The current state is in red, 5, 0, 10, 15. Input is what is causing the transition. N or D means either N or D will make that transition happen from state 2 to state 3. Both N complement and D e complement. That means that you are not giving a nickel, not giving a dime. You just stay there. So that's kind of what we have derived over here. All right. Now we have, how many, we have a few more minutes. The next uh, slide essentially talks about. Uh, so because input changes state but not output, it's not a medium. Because input changes state, but not output. No, 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 no. So the output at any given time is dependent on in which state the finite state machine is in. That's the reason why it's melee. The output is not dependent on the, trans the, the arrow, right? Starting from this, to this, right? So the, the output is tied to the state your FSM is in. 
that's why uh, a Moore machine. It would have been a melee if the output had the ability to be associated with an arc. The arc is, why is this difference so important? Because this could lead to you designing FSM in much, uh, a very few um, states. So for example, if I if I kind of jump ahead a little bit, I want to show you guys how you can design the same odd parity checker with a melee machine. We are going to come back to this in the next lecture, but this is sort of a comparison there. We had three states for a Moore machine, but a melee machine can do the same job in two states. Right, this is for a certain example. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it later. But that's what melee allows you to do. It, it allows you to have more arrows, right? Because now the inputs are, uh, in, outputs are associated with the arrows, right? So you could have different outputs for different arrows. Earlier, your outputs were tied to the state. You could only have one, right? That's what allows you to do the same job with fewer number of states and which is why it is important. All right, let's come back to this. Um, how many states does this guy have? How many states does this have? How many states? Very easy question. Four. So how many flip-flops do I need to to make this finite state machine. How many flip-flops are needed? Two flip-flops are needed. Oh, 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 no, no. So two flip-flops, the outputs are Q1, Q0, for example. Right? The outputs could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Those are your four states. Now, let me, let me tie this to the, the counter design problem that we did. In our counter, we could have a maximum of how many states this one was a three bit counter right so the maximum number of states we could have had was eight that's right and for eight we needed how many flip-flops we didn't need eight flip-flops we needed three flip-flops right we needed three flip-flops for that that's right so there is a log to the base two relationship here right So what is the relationship? How many number of uh, flip-flops do I need? Uh, no, as a general equation. Number of flip-flops. I would do log to the base two of number of states. but I would round up the number of states to the next highest power of two, right? Round up to next highest power of two. So six states, you would, you would consider that as eight states. So our uh, state diagram that we came up with has two flip-flops. But for some reason, if we went with option number one, how many flip-flops would, would we have needed? Four, because 16 states, we would have needed four flip-flops, right? What that means is, if you are very creative in um, 
Doing the design using fewer number of states, then you will have fewer number of flip-flops, which will save you money, right? So that's where your creativity will go. That's why coming up with the state diagram is the is the more difficult part of this exercise. After that, it is going to be the, the same symbolic state transition table, encoded state transition table, blah, 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 flip-flops at the end. It's going to be very straightforward. Uh, seems like it's not worth it. One flip-flop to double the number of... Uh, well, it doesn't... So, in this example, maybe it's not worth it. But as the power of 2 goes up, it will be very significant. Right, so here I'll give you an example where uh, you know you can really think about saving up the the states, right? So there was an elevator design problem that I ha had assigned uh, many semesters ago, and the students were asked to sort of come up with their own finite state machine, right? Their their own ideas about the number of states. One student said, "If it's an eight floor building, I will have eight different states to talk about." the eight floors in the building. I'm on floor one, I'm on floor two, I'm on floor three and so on. And another student said, hey, I'll just have three states. Moving up, moving down, not moving. Right? So you can, you can, and now if you think about a building that had like 60 floors and so on, you can clearly see that you can do the same job with very few number of states. Right? That's when it'll actually matter. But the idea right now is, you benefit from doing things that exactly function the same way, but with fewer number of states. All right. Uh, I think that's where I will stop for today. I will uh, see you guys again on Friday. Uh, we will wrap up our discussion on finite state machine concept, and then we will try to move into design.